chapter eight of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight drake clips the wings of spain for three years after drake had been dubbed sir francis by the queen he was the hero of every class of englishmen but two the extreme roman catholics who wanted mary queen of scots and the merchants who were doing business with portugal and spain the marian opposition to the general policy of england persisted for a few years longer but the merchants who were the inheritors of centuries of commercial intercourse with england's new enemies were soon to receive a shock that completely changed their minds they were themselves one of the strongest factors that made for war in the knotty problem now to be solved at the cannon's mouth because english trade was seeking new outlets in every direction and was beating hard against every door that foreigners shut in its face these merchants would not however support the war party till they were forced to as they still hoped to gain by other means what only war could win the year that drake came home one thousand five hundred and eighty philip at last got hold of a sea-going fleet the eleven big portuguese galleons taken when lisbon fell with the portuguese ships sailors and oversea possessions with more galleons under construction at santander in spain and with the galleons of the indian guard built by the great menendez to protect new spain with all this performed or promised philip began to feel as if the hour was at hand when he could do to england what she had done to him in one thousand five hundred and eighty three santa cruz the best spanish admiral since the death of menendez proposed to form the nucleus of the great armada out of the fleet with which he had just broken down the last vestige of portuguese resistance in the azores from that day on the idea was never dropped at the same time elizabeth discovered the paris plot between mary and philip and the catholics of france all of whom were bent on her destruction england stood to arms but false ideas of naval defence were uppermost in the queen's council no attempt was made to strike a concentrated blow at the heart of the enemy's fleet in his own waters instead of this the english ships were carefully divided among the three squadrons meant to defend the approaches to england ireland and scotland because as the queen in council sagely remarked who could be expected to know what the enemy's point of attack would be the fact is that when wielding the forces of the fleet and army the queen and most of her non-combatant counsellors never quite reached that supreme point of view from which the greatest statesmen see exactly where civil control ends and civilian interference begins luckily for england their mistakes were once more covered up by a turn of the international kaleidoscope no sooner had the immediate danger of a great combined attack on england passed away than elizabeth returned to drake's plan for a regular raid against new spain though it had to be one that was not designed to bring on war in europe drake who was a member of the navy board charged with the reorganization of the fleet was to have command the ships and men were ready but the time had not yet come next year one thousand five hundred and eighty four amadas and barlow sir walter raleigh's two prospectors for the plantation of virginia were being delighted with the summer lands and waters of what is now north carolina we shall soon hear more of raleigh and his vision of the west but at this time a good many important events were happening in europe and it is these that we must follow first william of orange the washington of holland was assassinated at philip's instigation while plots to kill elizabeth and place mary on the throne began to multiply the agents were executed while a bond of association was signed by all elizabeth's chief supporters binding them to hunt down and kill all who tried to kill her a plain hint for mary queen of scots to stop plotting or stand the consequences but the merchants trading with spain and portugal were more than ever for keeping on good terms with philip because the failure of the spanish harvest had induced him to offer them special protection and encouragement if they would supply his country's needs at once 
every available ton of shipping was accordingly taken up for spain the english merchant fleet went out and big profits seemed assured but presently the primrose a tall ship of london came flying home to say that philip had suddenly seized the merchandise imprisoned the men and taken the ships and guns for use with the great armada that was the last straw the peaceful traders now saw that they were wrong and that the fighting ones were right and for the first time both could rejoice over the clever trick by which john hawkins had got his own again from philip in one thousand five hundred and seventy one three years after don martin's treachery at san juan de ulua hawkins while commanding the scilly island squadron led the spanish ambassador to believe that he would go over to the spanish cause in ireland if his claims for damages were only paid in full and all his surviving men in mexico were sent home the cold and crafty philip swallowed this tempting bait sent the men home with spanish dollars in their pockets and paid hawkins forty thousand pounds the worth of about two million dollars now then hawkins used the information he had picked up behind the spanish scenes to unravel the ridolfi plot for putting mary on the throne in one thousand five hundred and seventy two the year of st bartholomew no wonder philip hated sea dogs things new and old having reached this pass the whole of england bar the marians were eager for the great indies voyage of one thousand five hundred and eighty five londoners crowded down to woolwich with great jollity to see off their own contingent on its way to join drake's flag at plymouth very probably shakespeare went down too for that famous london merchantman the tiger to which he twice alludes once in macbeth and once in twelfth night was off with this contingent such a private fleet had never yet been seen twenty-one ships eight smart pinnaces and twenty-three hundred men of every rank and rating the queen was principal shareholder and managing director but as usual in colonial attacks intended for disavowal if necessity arose no prospectus or other document was published nor were the shareholders of this joint stock company known in any quite official way it was the size of the fleet and the reputation of the officers that made it a national affair drake now forty was admiral frobisher of northwest passage fame was vice nollies the queen's own cousin rear carlyle a famous general commanded the troops and sailed in shakespeare's tiger drake's old crew from the golden hind came forward to a man among them wright that excellent mathematician and engineer and big tom moon the lion of all boarding parties each in command of a ship but elizabeth was just then weaving the threads of an unusually intricate diplomatic pattern so doubts and delays orders and counter-orders vexed drake to the last sir philip sidney too came down as a volunteer which was another sore vexation since his european fame would have made him practically joint commander of the fleet although he was not a naval officer at all but he had the good sense to go back whereupon drake fearing further interruptions from the court ordered everything to be tumbled into the nearest ships and hurried off to sea under a press of sail the first port of call was vigo in the northwestern corner of spain where drake's envoy told the astonished governor that elizabeth wanted to know what philip intended doing about embargoes now if the governor wanted peace he must listen to drake's arguments if war well drake was ready to begin at once a three days storm interrupted the proceedings after which the english intercepted the fugitive townsfolk whose flight showed that the governor meant to make a stand though he had said the embargo had been lifted and that all the english prisoners were at liberty to go some english sailors however were still being held so drake sent in an armed party and brought them off with a good pile of reprisal booty too then he put to sea and made for the spanish main by way of the portuguese african islands the plan of campaign drawn up for burleigh's information still exists it shows that drake the consummate raider was also an admiral of the highest kind the items showing how long each part should take and what loot each place should yield are exact and interesting but it is in the relation of every part to every other part and to the whole that the original genius of the born commander shines forth in all its glory 
after taking san domingo he was to sack margarita la hacha and santa marta raising their fortifications as he left cartagena and nombre de dios came next then carlisle was to raid panama with the help of the maroons while drake himself was to raid the coast of honduras finally with reunited forces he would take havana and if possible hold it by leaving a sufficient garrison behind thus he would paralyze new spain by destroying all the points of junction along its lines of communication just when philip stood most in need of its help for completing the great armada but like a meddlesome steeplechaser drake took a leap in his stride during the preliminary canter before the great race the wind being foul for the canaries he went on to the cape verde archipelago and captured santiago which had been abandoned in terror on the approach of the english dragon that sinister hero of lope de vega's epic onslaught la dragontea as good luck would have it carlyle marched in on the anniversary of the queen's accession the seventeenth of november so there was a royal salute fired in her majesty's honour by land and sea no treasure was found french privateers had sacked the place three years before and had killed off every one they caught the portuguese however were not going to wait to meet the english dragon too the force that marched inland failed to unearth the governor so san domingo santiago and porto praya were all burnt to the ground before the fleet bore away for the west indies san domingo in hispaniola haiti was made in due course but only after a virulent epidemic had seriously thinned the ranks san domingo was the oldest town in new spain and was strongly garrisoned and fortified but carlyle's soldiers carried all before them drake battered down the seaward walls the spaniards abandoned the citadel at night and the english took the whole place as a new year's gift for one thousand five hundred and eighty six but again there was no treasure the spaniards had killed off the caribs in war or in the mines so that nothing was now dug out moreover the citizens were quite on their guard against adventurers and ready to hide what they had in the most inaccessible places drake then put the town up to ransom and sent out his own maroon boy servant to bring in the message from the spanish officer proposing terms this spaniard hating all maroons ran his lance through the boy and cantered away the boy came back with the last ounce of his strength and fell dead at drake's feet drake sent to say he would hang two spaniards every day if the murderer was not hanged by his own compatriots as no one came he began with two friars then the spaniards brought in the offender and hanged him in the presence of both armies that episode cleared the air and an interchange of courtesies and hospitalities immediately followed but no business was done drake therefore began to burn the town bit by bit till twenty-five thousand ducats were paid it was very little for the capital but the men picked up a good deal of loot in the process and vented their ultra protestant zeal on all the graven images that were not worth keeping for sale on the whole the english were well satisfied they had taken all the spanish ships and armament they wanted destroyed the rest liberated over a hundred brawny galley slaves some turks among them all anxious for revenge and had struck a blow at spanish prestige which echoed back to europe spain never hid her light under a bushel and here in the governor's palace was a huge escutcheon with a horse standing on the earth and pawing at the sky the motto blazoned on it was to the effect that the earth itself was not enough for spain non sufficit orbis drake's humour was greatly tickled and he and his officers kept asking the spaniards to translate the motto again and again delays and tempestuous headwinds induced drake to let intermediate points alone and make straight for cartagena on the south american mainland cartagena had been warned and was on the alert it was strong by both nature and art the garrison was good of its kind though the spaniards custom of fighting in quilted jackets instead of armour put them at a disadvantage this custom was due to the heat and to the fact that the jackets were proof against the native arrows there was an outer and an inner harbour with such an intricate and well defended passage that no one thought drake would dare go in but he did frobisher had failed to catch a pilot but drake did the trick without one to the utter dismay of the spaniards 
after some more very clever manoeuvres to distract the enemy's attention from the real point of attack carlyle and the soldiers landed under cover of the dark and came upon the town where they were least expected by wading waist deep through the water just out of sight of the spanish gunners the entrenchments did not bar the way in this unexpected quarter but wine casks full of rammed earth had been hurriedly piled there in case the mad english should make the attempt carlyle gave the signal goring's musketeers sprang forward and fired into the spaniards faces then sampson's pikemen charged through and a desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued finally the spaniards broke after carlyle had killed their standard-bearer and goring had wounded and taken their commander the enemies ran pell-mell through the town together till the english were reformed in the plaza next day drake moved in to attack the harbour fort whereupon it was abandoned and the whole place fell but again there was a dearth of booty the spaniards were getting shy of keeping too many valuables where they could be taken so negotiations emphasized by piecemeal destruction went on till sickness and the lateness of the season put the english in a sorry fix the sack of the city had yielded much less than that of san domingo and the men who were all volunteers to be paid out of plunder began to grumble at their ill success many had been wounded several killed big faithful tom moon among them a hundred died more were ill two councils of war were held one naval the other military the military officers agreed to give up all their own shares to the men but the naval officers who were poorer and who were also responsible for the expenses of their vessels could not concur finally one hundred and ten thousand ducats equivalent in purchasing power to nearly three millions of dollars were accepted it was now impossible to complete the programme or even to take havana in view of the renewed sickness the losses and the advance of the season a further disappointment was experienced when drake just missed the treasure fleet by only half a day though through no fault of his own then with constantly diminishing numbers of effective men the course was shaped for the spanish plantation of st augustine in florida this place was utterly destroyed and some guns and money were taken from it then the fleet stood north again till on the ninth of june it found raleigh's colony of roanoke ralph lane the governor was in his fort on the island ready to brave it out drake offered a free passage home to all the colonists but lane preferred staying and going on with his surveys and plantation drake then filled up a store-ship to leave behind with lane but a terrific three-day storm wrecked the store-ship and damped the colonists enthusiasm so much that they persuaded lane to change his mind the colonists embarked and the fleet then bore away for home though balked of much it had expected in the way of booty reduced in strength by losses and therefore unable to garrison any strategic point which would threaten the life of new spain its purely naval work was a true and glorious success when he arrived at plymouth drake wrote immediately to burleigh my very good lord there is now a very great gap opened very little to the liking of the king of spain this very great gap on the american side of the atlantic was soon to be matched by the still greater gap drake was to make on the european side by destroying the spanish armada and thus securing that mightiest of ocean highways through which the hosts of emigration afterwards poured into a land endowed with the goodly heritage of english liberty and the english tongue the year of drake's return one thousand five hundred and eighty six was no less troublous than its immediate predecessors the discovery of the babington plot to assassinate elizabeth and to place mary on the throne supported by scotland france and spain proved mary's complicity produced an actual threat of war from france and made the pope and philip gnash their teeth with rage the roman catholic allied powers had no sufficient navy and philip's credit was at its lowest ebb after drake's devastating raid the english were exultant east and west for the true report of a worthy fight performed in the voyage from turkey by five ships of london against eleven galleys and two frigates of the king of spain at panta laria within the straits of gibraltar anno one thousand five hundred and eighty six was going the rounds and running a close second to drake's west india achievement the ignorant and thoughtless both then and since mistook this fight and another like it in one thousand five hundred and ninety to mean that english merchantmen could beat off spanish men-of-war 
nothing of the kind the english levanters were heavily armed and admirably manned by well-trained fighting crews and what these actions really proved if proof was necessary was that galleys were no match for broadsides from the proper kind of sailing ships turkey came into the problems of one thousand five hundred and eighty six in more than name for there was a vast diplomatic scheme on foot to unite the turks with such portuguese as would support antonio the pretender to the throne of portugal and the rebellious dutch against spain catholic france and mary stuart's scotland leicester was in the netherlands with an english army fighting indecisively losing sir philip sidney and angering elizabeth by accepting the governor-generalship without her leave and against her diplomacy which now as ever was opposed to any definite avowal that could possibly be helped meanwhile the great armada was working up its strength and drake was commissioned to weaken it as much as possible but on the eighth of february one thousand five hundred and eighty seven before he could sail mary was at last beheaded and elizabeth was once more entering on a tricky course of torturous diplomacy too long by half to follow here as the great crisis approached it had become clearer and clearer that it was a case of kill or be killed between elizabeth and mary and that england could not afford to leave marian enemies in the rear when there might be a vast catholic alliance in the front but as a sovereign elizabeth disliked the execution of any crowned head as a wily woman she wanted to make the most of both sides and as a diplomatist she would not have open war and direct operations going down to the root of the evil if devious ways would do so the peace party of the council prevailed again and drake's orders were changed he had been going as a lion the peace party now tried to send him as a fox but he stretched his instructions to their utmost limits and even defied the custom of the service by holding no council of war when deciding to swoop on cadiz as they entered the harbour the english saw sixty ships engaged in preparations for the great armada many had no sails to keep the crews from deserting others were waiting for their guns to come from italy ten galleys rowed out to protect them the weather and surroundings were perfect for these galleys but as they came end on in line abreast drake crossed their t in line ahead with the shattering broadsides of four queen's ships which soon sent them flying each galley was the upright of the t each english sailing ship the corresponding crosspiece then drake attacked the shipping and wrecked it right and left next morning he led the pinnaces and boats into the inner harbour where they cut out the big galleon belonging to santa cruz himself the spanish commander-in-chief then the galleys got their chance again an absolutely perfect chance because drake's fleet was becalmed at the very worst possible place for sailing ships and the very best possible place for the well-oared galleys but even under these extraordinary circumstances the ships smashed the galleys up with broadside fire and sent them back to cover then the spaniards towed some fire-ships out but the english rowed for them threw grappling irons into them and gave them a turn that took them clear then for the last time the galleys came on as bravely but as uselessly as ever when drake sailed away he left the shipping of cadiz completely out of action for months to come though fifteen sail escaped destruction in the inner harbour his own losses were quite insignificant the next objective was cape st vincent so famous through centuries of naval history because it is the great strategic salient thrust out into the atlantic from the southwest corner of europe and thus commands the flank approaches to and from the mediterranean to and from the coast of africa and in those days the route to and from new spain by way of the azores here drake had trouble with burrow his second-in-command a friend of cautious burley and a man hidebound in the warfare of the past a sort of english don burrow objected to drake's taking decisive action without the vote of a council of war remembering the terrors of italian textbooks he had continued to regard the galleys with much respect in the harbour of cadiz even after drake had broken them with ease finally still clinging to the old ways of mere raids and reprisals he stood aghast at the idea of seizing cape st vincent and making it a base of operations drake promptly put him under arrest 
sagra's castle commanding the roadstead of cape st vincent was extraordinarily strong the cliffs on which it occupied about a hundred acres rose sheer two hundred feet all round except at a narrow and well defended neck only two hundred yards across drake led the stormers himself while half his eight hundred men kept up a continuous fire against every spaniard on the wall the other half rushed piles of faggots in against the oak and iron gate drake was foremost in this work carrying faggots himself and applying the first match for two hours the fight went on when suddenly the spaniards sounded a parley their commanding officer had been killed and the woodwork of the gate had taken fire in those days a garrison that would not surrender was put to the sword when captured so these spaniards may well be excused drake willingly granted them the honours of war and so even to his own surprise the castle fell without another blow the minor forts near by at once surrendered and were destroyed while the guns of sagras were thrown over the cliffs and picked up by the men below the whole neighbouring coast was then swept clear of the fishing fleet which was the main source of supply used for the great armada the next objective was lisbon the headquarters of the great armada one of the finest harbours in the world and then the best fortified of all taking it was of course out of the question without a much larger fleet accompanied by an overwhelming army but drake reconnoitred to good effect learnt wrinkles that saved him from disaster two years later and retired after assuring himself that an armada which could not fight him then could never get to england during the same season ship fevers and all the other epidemics that dogged the old sailing fleets and scourged them like the plague never waited long drake was soon short-handed to add to his troubles burrow sailed away for home whereupon drake tried him and his officers by court-martial and condemned them all to death this penalty was never carried out for reasons we shall soon understand since no reinforcements came from home cape st vincent could not be held any longer there was however one more stroke to make the great east india spanish treasure ship was coming home and drake made up his mind to have her off the azores he met her coming towards him and dipping her colours again and again to ask him who he was but he would put out no flag till we were within shot of her when we hanged out flags streamers and pendants which done we hailed her with cannon shot and having shot her through divers times she shot at us then we began to ply her hotly our fly-boat lightly armed supply vessel of comparatively small size and one of our pinnaces lying athwart her hawse across her bows at whom she shot and threw fireworks incendiary missiles but did them no hurt in that her ordnance lay so high over them then she seeing us ready to lay her aboard range up alongside all of our ships plying her so hotly and resolutely determined to make short work of her they yielded to us the spaniards fought bravely as they generally did but they were only naval amateurs compared with the trained professional sea-dogs the voyage was now made in the old sense of that term for this prize was the greatest ship in all portugal richly laden to our happy joy the relative values then and now are impossible to fix because not only was one dollar the equivalent in most ways of ten dollars now but in view of the smaller material scale on which men's lives were lived these ten dollars might themselves be multiplied by ten or more without producing the same effect as the multiplied sum would now produce on international affairs suffice it to say that the ship was worth nearly five million dollars of actual cash and ten twenty thirty or many more millions if present sums of money are to be considered relatively to the national incomes of those poorer days but better than spices jewels and gold were the secret documents which revealed the dazzling profits of the new east india trade by sea from that time on for the next twelve years the london merchants and their friends at court worked steadily for official sanction in this most promising direction at last on the thirty first of december one thousand six hundred the documents captured by drake produced their result and the east india company by far the greatest corporation of its kind the world has ever seen was granted a royal charter for exclusive trade drake may therefore be said not only to have set the course for the united states but to have actually discovered the route leading to the empire of india now peopled by three hundred million subjects of the british crown 
so ended the famous campaign in one thousand five hundred and eighty seven popularly known as the singeing of king philip's beard beyond a doubt it was the most consummate work of naval strategy which up to that time all history records end of chapter eight chapter nine of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine drake and the spanish armada with fifteen hundred and eighty eight the final crisis came philip haughty gloomy and ambitious philip unskilled in arms but persistent in his plans sat in his palace at madrid like a spider forever spinning webs that enemies tore down drake and the english had thrown the whole scheme of the armada's mobilization completely out of gear philip's well-intentioned orders and counter-orders had made confusion worse confounded and though the spanish empire held half the riches of the world it felt the lack of ready money because english sea-power had made it all parts and no whole for several months together then when mobilization was resumed philip found himself distracted by expert advice from santa cruz his admiral and from parma alva's successor in the netherlands the general idea was to send the invincible armada up the english channel as far as the netherlands where parma would be ready with a magnificent spanish army waiting aboard troopships for safe conduct into england the spanish regulars could then hold london up to ransom or burn it to the ground so far so good but philip to whom amphibious warfare remained an unsolved mystery thought that the armada and the spanish army could conquer england without actually destroying the english fleet he could not see where raids must end and conquest must begin most spaniards agreed with him parma and santa cruz did not parma as a very able general wanted to know how his oversea communications could be made quite safe santa cruz as a very able admiral knew that no such sea road could possibly be safe while the ubiquitous english navy was undefeated and at large some time or other a naval battle must be won or parma's troops cut off from their base of supplies and surrounded like an island by an angry sea of enemies must surely perish when first at sea and then on land said the expert warriors santa cruz and parma get into hated england with the least possible fighting risk or loss said the mere politician philip and then crush drake if he annoys you early and late persistent philip slaved away upon this enterprise of england with incredible toil he spun his web anew the ships were collected into squadrons the squadrons at last began to wear the semblance of a fleet but semblance only there were far too many soldiers and not nearly enough sailors instead of sending the fighting fleet to try to clear the way for the troop ships coming later on philip mixed army and navy together the men of war were not bad of their kind but the kind was bad they were floating castles high out of the water crammed with soldiers some other landsmen and stores and with only light ordnance badly distributed so as to fire at rigging and superstructures only not at the halls as the english did yet this was not the worst the worst was that the fighting fleet was cumbered with troop ships which might have been useful in boarding but which were perfectly useless in fighting of any other kind and the english men-of-war were much too handy to be laid aboard by the lubberly spanish troop ships santa cruz worked himself to death in one of his last despatches he begged for more and better guns 
all philip could do was to authorize the purchase of whatever guns the foreign merchantmen in lisbon harbour could be induced to sell sixty second-rate pieces were obtained in this way then worn out by work and worry santa cruz died and philip forced the command on a most reluctant landlubber the duke of medina sidonia a very great grandee of spain but wholly unfitted to lead a fleet the death of santa cruz in whom the fleet and army had great confidence nearly upset the whole enterprise of england the captains were as unwilling to serve under bandy-legged sea-sick sidonia as he was unwilling to command them volunteering ceased compulsion failed to bring in the skilled ratings urgently required the sailors were now not only fewer than ever sickness and desertion had been thinning their ranks but many of these few were unfit for the higher kinds of seamanship while only the merest handful of them were qualified as seamen gunners philip however was determined and so the doomed armada struggled on fitting its imperfect parts together into a still more imperfect whole until in june it was as ready as it ever could be made meanwhile the english had their troubles too these were also political but the english navy was of such overwhelming strength that it could stand them with impunity the queen after thirty years of wonderful if torturous diplomacy was still disinclined to drop the art in which she was supreme for that in which she counted for so much less and by which she was obliged to spend so very much more there was still a little peace party also bent on diplomacy instead of war negotiations were opened with parma at flushing and diplomatic feelers went out towards philip who sent back some of his own but the time had come for war the stream was now too strong for either elizabeth or philip to stem or even divert into minor channels lord howard of effingham as lord high admiral of england was charged with the defence at sea it was impossible in those days to have any great force without some great nobleman in charge of it because the people still looked on such men as their natural viceroys and commanders but just as sir john norreys the most expert professional soldier in england was made chief of the staff to the earl of leicester ashore so drake was made chief of the staff to howard afloat which meant that he was the brain of the fleet a directing brain was sadly needed not that brains were lacking but that some one man of original and creative genius was required to bring the modern naval system into triumphant being like all political heads elizabeth was sensitive to public opinion and public opinion was ignorant enough to clamour for protection by something that a man could see besides which there were all those weaklings who had been described as the old women of both sexes in all ages and who have always been the nuisance they are still adding together the old views of warfare which nearly everybody held and the human weaknesses we have always with us there was a most dangerously strong public opinion in favour of dividing up the navy so as to let enough different places actually see that they had some visible means of divided defence the thirtieth of march fifteen hundred and eighty eight is the day of days to be remembered in the history of sea power because it was then that drake writing from plymouth to the queen in council first formulated the true doctrine of modern naval warfare especially the cardinal principle that the best of all defence is to attack your enemy's main fleet as it issues from its ports this marked the birth of the system perfected by nelson and thence passed on with many new developments to the british grand fleet in the great war of to-day the first step was by far the hardest for drake had to convert the queen and howard to his own revolutionary views he at last succeeded and on the seventh of july sailed for corunna where the armada had rendezvoused after being dispersed by a storm 
every man afloat knew that the hour had come yet elizabeth partly on the score of expense partly not to let drake snap her apron-strings completely had kept the supply of food and even of ammunition very short so much so that drake knew he would have to starve or else replenish from the spanish fleet itself as he drew near corunna on the eighth the spaniards were again reorganizing hundreds of perfectly useless landlubbers shipped at lisbon to complete the absurdly undermanned ships were being dismissed at corunna on the ninth when sidonia assembled a council of war to decide whether to put to sea or not the english van was almost in sight of the coast but then the north wind flawed failed and at last chopped round a roaring sou'wester came on and the great strategic move was over on the twelfth the fleet was back in plymouth replenishing as hard as it could howard behaved to perfection drake worked the strategy and tactics but howard had to set the tone afloat and ashore to all who came within his sphere of influence and right well he said it his dispatches at this juncture are models of what such documents should be and their undaunted confidence is in marked contrast to what the doomed spanish officers were writing at the self-same time the south-west wind that turned drake back brought the armada out and gave it an advantage which would have been fatal to england had the fleets been really equal or the spaniards in superior strength for a week was a very short time in which to replenish the stores that elizabeth had purposely kept so low drake and howard so the story goes were playing a game of bowls on plymouth hoe on friday afternoon the nineteenth of july when captain fleming of the golden hind rushed up to say the spanish fleet was off the lazard only sixty miles away all eyes turned to drake divining the right way to calm the people he whispered an order and then said out loud there's time to end our game and beat the spaniards too the shortness of food and ammunition that had compelled him to come back instead of waiting to blockade now threatened to get him nicely caught in the very trap he had wished to catch the great armada in himself for the spaniards coming up with the wind might catch him struggling out against the wind and crush his long emerging column bit by bit precisely as he had intended crushing their own column as it issued from the tagus or corona but it was only the van that fleming had sighted many a spanish straggler was still hauled down astern and sidonia had to wait for all to close and form up properly meanwhile drake and howard were straining every nerve to get out of plymouth it was not their fault but the queen's in council that sidonia had unwittingly stolen this march on them it was their glory that they won the lost advantage back again all afternoon and evening all through that summer night the sea-dog crews were warping out of harbour torches flares and cressets threw their fitful light on toiling lines of men hauling on ropes that moved the ships apparently like snails but once in plymouth sound the whinnying sheaves and long yo hoes told that all the sail the ships could carry was being made for a life-or-death effort to win the weather gauge thus beat the heart of naval england that momentous night in plymouth sound while beacons blazed from height to height ashore horsemen spurred off post-haste with orders and dispatches and every able-bodied landsman stood to arms next morning drake was in the channel near the eddystone with fifty-four sail when he sighted a dim blur to windward through the thickening mist and drizzling rain this was the great armada rain came on and killed the wind all sail was taken in aboard the english fleet which lay under bare poles invisible to the spaniards who still announced their presence with some show of canvas in actual size and numbers the spaniards were superior at first but as the week-long running fight progressed the english evened up with reinforcements spanish vessels looked bigger than their tonnage being high-built 
and spanish official reports likewise exaggerated the size because their system of measurement made their three tons equal to an english four in armament and seamen gunners the english were perhaps five times as strong as the armada and seamen gunners won the day the english seamen greatly outnumbered the spanish seamen utterly surpassed them in seamanship and enjoyed the further advantage of having far handier vessels to work the spanish grand total for all ranks and ratings was thirty thousand men the english only fifteen but the spaniards were six thousand short on arrival and their actual seamen many of whom were only half trained then numbered a bare seven thousand the seventeen thousand soldiers only made the ship so many death traps for they were of no use afloat except as boarding parties and no boarding whatever took place the english fifteen thousand on the other hand were three-quarters seamen and one-quarter soldiers who were mostly trained as marines and this total was actually present on the whole it is hardly an exaggeration to say that the armada was mostly composed of armed transports while all the english vessels that counted in the fighting were real men of war in every one of the armada's hundred and twenty-eight vessels says an officer of the spanish flagship our people kneeled down and offered a prayer beseeching our lord to give us victory against the enemies of his holy faith the crews of the hundred and ninety-seven english vessels which at one time or another were present in some capacity on the scene of action also prayed for victory to the lord of hosts but took the proper naval means to win it trust in the lord and keep your powder dry said oliver cromwell when about to ford a river in the presence of the enemy and so in other words said drake all day long on that fateful twentieth of july the visible armada with its swinging canvas was lying to fifteen miles west of the invisible bare-masted english fleet sidonia held a council of war which landsmen-like believed that the english were divided one half watching parma the other the armada the trained soldiers and sailors were for the sound plan of attacking plymouth first some admirals even proposed the only perfect plan of crushing drake in detail as he issued from the sound all were in blissful ignorance of the astounding feat of english seamanship which had already robbed them of the only chance they ever had but philip also landsmanlike had done his best to thwart his own armada for sidonia produced the royal orders forbidding any attack on england till he and parma had joined hands drake however might be crushed piecemeal in the offing when still with his aftermost ships in the sound so with this true idea unworkable because based on false information the generals and admirals dispersed to their vessels and waited but then just as night was closing in the weather lifted enough to reveal drake's astonishing position immediately pinnaces went scurrying to sidonia for orders but he had none to give at one in the morning he learnt some more dumbfounding news that the english had nearly caught him at corona that drake and howard had joined forces and that both were now before him nor was even this the worst for while the distracted sidonia was getting his fleet into the eagle formation so suitable for galleys whose only fighting men were soldiers the english fleet was stealing the weather gauge his one remaining natural advantage an english squadron of eight sail manoeuvred coastwise on the armada's inner flank while unperceived by the spanish lookout drake stole away to sea beat round its outer flank and then making the most of a westerly slant in the shifting breeze edged into starboard the spaniards saw nothing till it was too late drake having given them a berth just wide enough to keep them quiet but when the sun rose there only a few miles off to windward was the whole main body of the english fleet coming on in faultless line ahead heeling nicely over on the port tack before the freshening breeze and far from waiting for the great armada boldly bearing down to the attack with this consummate move the victory was won the rest was slaughter 
borne by the spaniards with a resolution that nothing could surpass with dauntless tenacity they kept their eagle formation so useful at lepanto through seven dire days of most one-sided fighting whenever occasion seemed to offer the spaniards did their best to close to grapple and to board as had their heroes at lepanto but the english merely laughed ran in just out of reach poured in a shattering broadside between wind and water stood off to reload fired again with equal advantage at longer range caught the slow galleons end on raked them from stem to stern passed to and fro in one long deadly line ahead concentrating at will on any given target and did all this with well-nigh perfect safety to themselves in quite a different way close to but to the same effect at either distance long or short the english had the range of them as sailors say to-day close to the little spanish guns fired much too high to hull the english vessels lying low and trim upon the water with whose changing humours their lines fell in so much more happily than those of any lumbering spaniards could far off the little spanish guns did correspondingly small damage even when they managed to hit while the heavy metal of the english handled by real seamen gunners inflicted crushing damage in return but even more important than the englishmen's superiority in rig hull armament and expert seamanship was their tactical use of the thoroughly modern line ahead any one who will take the letter t as an illustration can easily understand the advantage of crossing his t the upright represents an enemy caught when in column ahead as he would be for instance when issuing from a narrow-necked port in this formation he can only use bow fire and that only in succession on a very narrow front but the fleet represented by the cross piece moving across the point of the upright is in the deadly line ahead with all its near broadsides turned in one long converging line of fire against the helplessly narrow fronted enemy if the enemy sticking to mediaeval tactics had room to broaden his front by forming column abreast as galleys always did that is with several uprights side by side he would still be at the same sort of disadvantage for this would only mean a series of t's with each nearest broadside crossing each opposing upright as before the herded soldiers and non-combatants aboard the great armada stood by their useless duties to the last thousands fell killed or wounded several times the spanish scuppers actually ran a horrid red as if the very ships were bleeding the priests behaved as bravely as the jesuits of new france and who could be braver than those undaunted missionaries were soldiers and sailors were alike what shall we do now asked sidonia after the slaughter had gone on for a week order up more powder said aquendo as dauntless as before even then the eagle formation was still kept up the van ships were the head the biggest galleons formed the body lighter vessels formed the wings a reserve formed the tail as the unflinching armada stood slowly up the channel a sail or two would drop out by the way dead beat one night several strange sail passed suddenly by drake what should he do to go about and follow them with all astern of him doing the same in succession was not to be thought of as his aftermost vessels were merchantmen wholly untrained to the exact combined manoeuvres required in a fighting fleet though first-rate individually there was then no night signal equivalent to the modern disregard the flagship's movements so drake doused his stern light went about overhauled the strangers and found they were bewildered german merchantmen he had just gone about once more to resume his own station when suddenly a spanish flagship loomed up beside his own flagship the revenge drake immediately had his pinnace lowered away to demand instant surrender but the spanish admiral was don pedro de valdez a very gallant commander and a very proud grandee who demanded terms and though his flagship which had been in collision with a run amuck seemed likely to sink he was quite ready to go down fighting yet the moment he heard that his summoner was drake he surrendered at discretion feeling it a personal honour according to the ideas of the age to yield his sword to the greatest seaman in the world with forty officers he saluted drake 
complimenting him on valour and felicity so great that mars and neptune seemed to attend him as also on his generosity towards the fallen foe a quality often experienced by the spaniards whereupon adds this eye-witness sir francis drake requiting his spanish compliments with honest english courtesies placed him at his own table and lodged him in his own cabin drake's enemies at home accused him of having deserted his fleet to capture a treasure-ship for there was a good deal of gold with valdez but the charge was quite unfounded a very different charge against howard had more foundation the armada had anchored at calais to get its breath before running the gauntlet for the last time and joining parma in the netherlands but in the dead of night when the flood was making and a strong west wind was blowing in the same direction as the swirling tidal stream nine english fireships suddenly burst into flame and made for the spanish anchorage there were no boats ready to grapple the fireships and tow them clear there was no time to weigh for every vessel had two anchors down sidonia enraged that the boats were not out on patrol gave the order for the whole fleet to cut their cables and make off for their lives as the great lumbering hulls which had of course been riding head to wind swung round in the dark and confusion several crashing collisions occurred next morning the armada was strung along the flemish coast in disorderly flight seeing the impossibility of bringing the leewardly vessels back against the wind in time to form up sidonia ran down with the windward ones and formed farther off howard then led in pursuit but seeing the capitana of the renowned italian galeasses in distress near calais he became a mediaeval knight again left his fleet and took the galeas for the moment that one feather in his cap seemed better worth having than a general victory drake forged ahead and led the pursuit in turn the spaniards fought with desperate courage still suffering ghastly losses but do what they could to bear up against the english and the wind they were forced to leeward of dunkirk and so out of touch with parma this was the result of the battle of grave lines fought on monday the twenty ninth of july fifteen hundred and eighty eight just ten days after captain fleming had rushed on to the bowling green of plymouth hoe where drake and howard their short work done were playing a game before embarking in those ten days the gallant armada had lost all chance of winning the overlordship of the sea and shaking the sea-dog grip off both americas a rising gale now forced it to choose between getting pounded to death on the shoals of dunkirk or running north through the north sea in which the british grand fleet of the twentieth century fought against the fourth attempt in modern times to win a world dominion north and still north round by the surf-lashed orkneys then down the wild west coasts of the hebrides and ireland went the forlorn armada losing ships and men at every stage until at last the remnant straggled into spanish ports like the mere wreckage of a storm End of chapter nine chapter ten of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the one and the fifty three the next year fifteen hundred and eighty nine is famous for the unsuccessful lisbon expedition drake had the usual troubles with elizabeth who wanted him to go about picking leaves and breaking branches before laying the axe to the root of the tree though there were in the narrow seas defensive squadrons strong enough to ward off any possible blow yet the nervous landsmen wanted corunna and other ports attacked and their shipping destroyed for fear england should be invaded before drake could strike his blow at lisbon then there were troubles about stores and ammunition the english fleet had been reduced to the last pound of powder twice during the ten days battle with the armada yet elizabeth was again alarmed at the expense of munitions she never quite rose to the idea of one supreme and finishing blow no matter what the cost might be this was a joint expedition the first in which a really modern english fleet and army had ever taken part with sir john norreys in command of the army there was no trouble about recruits for all men of spirit flocked in to follow drake and norreys 
the fleet was perfectly organized into appropriate squadrons and flotillas such as then corresponded with the battleships cruisers and mosquito craft of modern navies the army was organized into battalions and brigades with a regular staff and all the proper branches of the service the fleet made for corunna where norreys won a brilliant victory a curious little incident of exact punctilio is worth recording after the battle and when the fleet was waiting for a fair wind to get out of the harbour the ships were much annoyed by a battery on the heights norreys undertook to storm the works and sent in the usual summons by a parlementaire accompanied by a drummer an angry spaniard fired from the walls and the drummer fell dead the english had hostages on whom to take reprisals but the spaniards were too quick for them within ten minutes the guilty man was tried inside the fort by drumhead court-martial condemned to death and swung out neatly from the walls while a polite spanish officer came over to assure the english troops that such a breach of discipline should not occur again lisbon was a failure the troops landed and marched over the ground north of lisbon where wellington in a later day made works whose fame has caused their memory to become an allusion in english literature for any impregnable base the lines of torres vedras the fleet and the army now lost touch with each other and that was the ruin of them all norreys was persuaded by don antonio pretender to the throne of portugal which philip had seized to march farther inland where portuguese patriots were said to be ready to rise en masse this antonio was a great talker and a first-rate fighter with his tongue but his portuguese followers also great talkers wanted to see a victory won by arms before they rose before leaving lisbon drake had one stroke of good luck a spanish convoy brought in a hanseatic dutch and german fleet of merchantmen loaded down with contraband of war destined for philip's new armada drake swooped on it immediately and took sixty well-found ships then he went west to the azores looking for what he calls some comfortable little dew of heaven that is of course more prizes of a richer kind but sickness broke out the men died off like flies storms completed the discomfiture and the expedition got home with a great deal less than half its strength in men and not enough in value to pay for its expenses it was held to have failed and drake lost favour with the sun of drake's glory in eclipse at court and with spain and england resting from warfare on the grander scale there were no more big battles the following year but the year after that fifteen hundred and ninety one is rendered famous in the annals of the sea by sir richard grenville's fight in drake's old flagship the revenge this is the immortal battle of the one in the fifty-three from which raleigh's prose and tennyson's verse have made a glory of the pen fit to match the glory of the sword grenville had sat with drake and sir philip sidney on the parliamentary committee which recommended the royal charter granted to sir walter raleigh for the founding of the first english colony in what is now the united states grenville's grandfather marshal of calais to henry the eighth had the faculty of rhyme and in a set of verses very popular in their own day showed what the grenville family ambitions were who seeks the way to win renown or flies with wings to high desire who seeks to wear the laurel crown or hath the mind that would aspire let him his native soil eschew let him go range and seek anew grenville himself was a wild and roving blade no great commander but an adventurer of the most daring kind by land or sea he rather enjoyed the consternation he caused by aping the airs of a pirate king he had a rough way with him at all times and ralph lane was much set against his being the commander of the virginia voyage of which lane himself was the governor on land but in action he always was beyond a doubt the very beau ideal of a first-class fighting man a striking instance of his methods was afforded on his return from virginia when he found an armed spanish treasure-ship ahead of him at sea he had no boat to board her with but he knocked 
some sort of one together out of the ship's chests and sprang up the spaniard's side with his boarding party just as this makeshift boat was sinking under them the last fight of the revenge is almost incredible from the odds engaged fifty-three vessels to one but it is true and neither raleigh's glowing prose nor tennyson's glowing verse exaggerates it lord thomas howard almost famished for want of prey had been cruising in search of treasure ships when captain middleton one of the gentlemen adventurers who followed the gallant earl of cumberland came in to warn him that don alonzo de bazan was following with fifty-three sail the english crews were partly ashore at the azores and howard had barely time to bring them off cut his cables and work to windward of the overwhelming spaniards grenville's men were last the revenge had only her hundred fighters on deck and her ninety-six below when the spanish fleet closed round him yet just as he had sworn to cut down the first man who touched a sail when the master thought there was still a chance to slip through so now he refused to surrender on any terms at all then running down close hauled on the starboard tack decks cleared for action and crew at battle quarters he steered right between two divisions of the spanish fleet till the mountain-like san philippe of fifteen hundred tons ranging up on his weather side blanketed his canvas and left him almost becalmed immediately the vessels which the revenge had weathered hauled their wind and came up on her from to leeward then at three o'clock in the afternoon of the first of september fifteen hundred and ninety one that immortal fight began the first broadside from the revenge took the san philippe on the water line and forced her to give way and stop her leaks then two spaniards ranged up in her place while two more kept station on the other side and so the desperate fight went on all through that afternoon and evening and far on into the night meanwhile howard still keeping the weather gauge attacked the spaniards from the rear and thought of trying to cut through them but his sailing master swore it would be the end of all her majesty's ships engaged as it probably would so he bore away wisely or not as critics may judge for themselves one vessel the little george noble of london of victualler stood by the revenge offering help before the fight began but grenville thanking her gallant skipper ordered him to save his vessel by following howard with never less than one enemy on each side of her the revenge fought furiously on boarders away shouted the spanish colonels as the vessels closed repel boarders shouted grenville in reply and they did repel them time and again till the english pikes dripped red with spanish blood a few spaniards gained the deck only to be shot stabbed or slashed to death towards midnight grenville was hit in the body by a musket shot fired from the tops the same sort of shot that killed nelson the surgeon was killed while dressing the wound and grenville was hit in the head but still the fight went on the revenge had already sunk two spaniards a third sank afterwards and a fourth was beached to save her but grenville would not hear of surrender when day broke not ten unwounded englishmen remained the pikes were broken the powder was spent the whole deck was a wild entanglement of masts spars sails and rigging the undaunted survivors stood dumb as their silent cannon but every spanish hull in the whole encircling ring of death bore marks of the revenge's rage four hundred spaniards by their own admission had been killed and quite six hundred wounded one hundred englishmen had thus accounted for a thousand spaniards besides all those that sank grenville now gave his last order sink me the ship master gunner but the sailing master and flag captain both wounded protesting that all lives should be saved to avenge the dead manned the only remaining boat and made good terms with the spanish admiral then grenville was taken very carefully aboard don bazan's flagship where he was received with every possible mark of admiration and respect don bazan gave him his own cabin the staff surgeon dressed his many wounds the spanish captains and military officers stood hat in hand wondering at his courage and stout heart for that he showed not any signs of faintness nor changing of his colour grenville spoke spanish very well and handsomely acknowledged the compliments they paid him then gathering his ebbing strength for one last effort he addressed them in words they have religiously recorded 
here die i richard grenville with a joyful and quiet mind for that i have ended my life as a true soldier ought to do that hath fought for his country queen religion and honour wherefore my soul most joyfully departeth out of this body and when he had said these and other such like words he gave up the ghost with a great and stout courage grenville's latest wish was that the revenge and he should die together and though he knew it not he had this wish fulfilled for two weeks later when don bazan had collected nearly a hundred more sail around him for the last stage home from the west indies a cyclone such as no living man remembered burst full on the crowded fleet not even the great armada lost more vessels than don bazan did in that wreck engulfing week no less than seventy went down and with them sank the shattered revenge beside her own heroic dead drake might be out of favour at court the queen might grumble at the sad extravagance of fleets diplomats might talk of untying gordian knots that the sword was made to cut courtiers and politicians might wonder with which side to curry favour when it was an issue between two parties peace or war the great mass of ordinary landsmen might wonder why the sea affair was a thing they could not understand but all this was only the mint and cumin of imperial things compared with the exalting deeds that drake had done for once the english sea-dogs had shown the way to all america by breaking down the barriers of spain england had ceased to be merely an island in a northern sea and had become the mother country of such an empire and republic as neither record nor tradition can show the like of elsewhere and england felt the triumph she thrilled with pregnant joy poet and proseman both gave voice to her delight hear this new note of exultation born of england's victory on the sea as god hath combined the sea and land into one globe so their mutual assistance is necessary to secular happiness and glory the sea covereth one half of this patrimony of man thus should man at once lose the half of his inheritance if the art of navigation did not enable him to manage this untamed beast and with the bridle of the winds and the saddle of his shipping make him serviceable now for the services of the sea they are innumerable it is the great purveyor of the world's commodities the conveyor of the excess of rivers uniter by traffic of all nations it presents the eye with divers colours and motions and is as it were with rich brooches adorned with many islands it is an open field for merchandise and peace a pitched field for the most dreadful fights in war yields diversity of fish and fowl for diet material for wealth medicine for sickness pearls and jewels for adornment the wonders of the lord in the deep for all instruction multiplicity of nature for contemplation to the thirsty earth fertile moisture to distant friends pleasant meeting to weary persons delightful refreshing to studious minds a map of knowledge a school of prayer meditation devotion and sobriety refuge to the distressed portage to the merchant customs to the prince passage to the traveller springs lakes and rivers to the earth it hath tempests and calms to chastise sinners and exercise the faith of seamen manifold affections to stupefy the supplest philosopher maintaineth as in our island a wall of defence and watery garrison to guard the state it entertains the sun with vapours the stars with a natural looking-glass the sky with clouds the air with temperateness the soil with suppleness the rivers with tides the hills with moisture the valleys with fertility but why should i longer detain you the sea yields action to the body meditation to the mind and the world to the world by this art of arts navigation well might this pious englishman the rev samuel purchase exclaim with david thy ways are in the sea and thy paths in the great waters and thy footsteps are not known the poet sang of drake in england too could this encompassment of all the world be more happily admired than in these four short lines the stars of heaven would thee proclaim if men here silent were the sun himself could not forget his fellow-traveller what wonder that after nombre the dios and the pacific the west indies and the spanish main cadiz and the armada what wonder after this that shakespeare english to the core rings out this royal throne of kings this sceptred isle this earth of majesty this seat of mars this other eden demi-paradise 
this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war this happy breed of men this little world this precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happy lands this blessed plot this earth this realm this england this england never did nor never shall lie at the proud foot of a conqueror but when it first did help to wound itself now these her princes are come home again come the three corners of the world in arms and we shall shock them naught shall make us rue if england to herself do rest but true end of chapter ten chapter eleven of elizabethan dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven raleigh and the vision of the west conquerors first prospectors second then the pioneers that is the order of those by whom america was opened up for english-speaking people no elizabethan colonies took root therefore the age of elizabethan sea-dogs was one of conquerors and prospectors not one of pioneering colonists at all spain and portugal alone founded sixteenth-century colonies that have had a continuous life from those days to our own virginia and new england like new france only began as permanent settlements after drake and queen elizabeth were dead virginia in sixteen hundred and seven new france in sixteen hundred and eight new england in sixteen twenty it is true that drake and his sea-dogs were prospectors in their way so were the soldiers gentlemen adventurers and fighting traders in theirs on the other hand some of the prospectors themselves belonged to the class of conquerors while many would have gladly been the pioneers of permanent colonies nevertheless the prospectors form a separate class and sir walter raleigh though an adventurer in every other way as well is undoubtedly their chief his colonies failed he never found his el dorado he died a ruined and neglected man but still he was the chief of those whom we can only call prospectors first because they tried their fortune ashore one step beyond the conquering sea-dogs and secondly because their fortune failed them just one step short of where the pioneering colonists began a man so various that he seemed to be not one but all mankind's epitome is a description written about a very different character but it is really much more appropriate to sir walter raleigh courtier and would-be coloniser soldier and sailor statesman and scholar poet and master of prose raleigh had one ruling passion greater than all the rest combined in a letter about america to sir robert cecil the son of queen elizabeth's principal minister of state lord burleigh he expressed this great determined purpose of his life i shall yet live to see it an english nation he had other interests in abundance perhaps in superabundance and he had much more than the usual temptations to live the life of fashion with just enough of public duty to satisfy both the queen and the very least that is implied by the motto noblesse oblige he was splendidly handsome and tall a perfect blend of strength and grace full of deep romantic interest in great things far and near the very man whom women dote on and yet through all the seductions of the court and all the storm and stress of europe he steadily pursued the vision of that west which he would make an english nation he left oxford as an undergraduate to serve the huguenots in france under admiral coligny and the protestants in holland under william of orange 
like hawkins and drake he hated spain with all his heart and paid off many a score against her by killing spanish troops at smerwick during an irish campaign marked by ruthless slaughter on both sides on his return to england he soon attracted the charmed attention of the queen his spreading his cloak for her to tread on lest she might wet her feet is one of those stories which ought to be true if it's not in any case he won the royal favour was granted monopolies promotion and estates and launched upon the full flood stream of fortune he was not yet thirty when he obtained for his half-brother sir humphrey gilbert then a man of thirty-eight a royal commission to inhabit and possess all remote and heathen lands not in the possession of any christian prince the draft of gilbert's original prospectus dated at london the sixth of november fifteen seventy seven and still kept there in the record office is an appeal to elizabeth in which he proposed to discover and inhabit some strange place gilbert was a soldier and knew what fighting meant so he likewise proposed to set forth certain ships of war to the new land which with your good license i will undertake without your majesty's charge the new land fish is a principal and rich in everywhere vendible merchandise and by the gain thereof shipping victual munition and the transporting of five or six thousand soldiers may be defrayed but gilbert's associates cared nothing for fish and everything for gold he went to the west indies lost a ship and returned without a fortune next year he was forbidden to repeat the experiment the project then languished until the fatal voyage of fifteen eighty three when gilbert set sail with six vessels intending to occupy newfoundland as the base from which to colonize southwards until an armed new england should meet and beat new spain how vast his scheme how pitiful its execution and yet how immeasurably beyond his wildest dreams the actual development to-day gilbert was not a sea-dog but a soldier with an uncanny reputation for being a regular jonah who had no good hap at sea he was also passionately self-willed and elizabeth had doubts about the propriety of backing him but she sent him a gilt anchor by way of good luck and off he went in june financed chiefly by raleigh whose name was given to the flagship gilbert's adventure never got beyond its base in newfoundland his ship the delight was wrecked the crew of the raleigh mutinied and ran her home to england the other four vessels held on but the men for the most part were neither good soldiers good sailors nor yet good colonists but ne'er-do-wells and desperadoes by september the expedition was returning broken down gilbert furious at the sailor's hints that he was just a little sea shy would persist in sticking to the lilliputian ten-ton squirrel which was woefully top hampered with guns and stores before leaving newfoundland he was implored to abandon her and bring her crew aboard a bigger craft but no do not fear he answered we are as near to heaven by sea as land one wild night off the azores the squirrel foundered with all hands amadis and barlow sailed in fifteen eighty four prospecting for sir walter raleigh they discovered several harbors in north carolina then part of the vast plantation of virginia roanoke island pamlico and albemarle sounds as well as the intervening waters were all explored with enthusiastic thoroughness and zeal barlow a skipper who was handy with his pen described the scent of that fragrant summer land in terms which attracted the attention of bacon at the time and of dryden a century later the royal charter authorizing raleigh to take what he could find in this strange land had a clause granting his prospective colonists all the privileges of free denizens and persons native of england in such ample manner as if they were born and personally resident in our said realm of england 
next year sir richard grenville who was raleigh's cousin convoyed out to roanoke the little colony which ralph lane governed and which as we have seen in an earlier chapter drake took home discomfited in fifteen eighty six there might have been a story to tell of successful colonization instead of failure if drake had kept away from roanoke that year or if he had tarried a few days longer for no sooner had the colony departed in drake's vessels than a ship sent out by sir walter raleigh freighted with all manner of things in most plentiful manner arrived at roanoke and after some time spent in seeking our colony up in the country and not finding them returned with all the aforesaid provision into england about a fortnight later sir richard grenville himself arrived with three ships not wishing to lose possession of the country where he had planted a colony the year before he landed fifteen men in the isle of roanoke furnished plentifully with all manner of provision for two years and so departed for england grenville unfortunately had burnt an indian town and all its standing corn because the indians had stolen a silver cup lane too had been severe in dealing with the natives and they had turned from friends to foes these and other facts were carefully recorded on the spot by the official chronicler thomas harriet better known as a mathematician among the captains who had come out under grenville in fifteen eighty five was thomas cavendish a young and daring gentleman adventurer greatly distinguished as such even in that adventurous age and the second english leader to circumnavigate the globe when drake was taking lane's men home in june fifteen eighty six cavendish was making the final preparations for a two-year voyage he sailed mostly along the route marked out by drake and many of his adventures were of much the same kind his prime object was to make the voyage pay a handsome dividend but he did notable service in clipping the wings of spain he raided the shipping off chile and peru took the spanish flagship the famous santa anna off the coast of california and on his return home in fifteen eighty eight had the satisfaction of reporting i burned and sank nineteen sail of ships both small and great and all the villages and towns that ever i landed at i burned and spoiled while cavendish was preying on spanish treasure in america and drake was singeing the king of spain's beard in europe raleigh still pursued his colonizing plans in fifteen eighty seven john white and twelve associates received incorporation as the governor and assistants of the city of raleigh in virginia the fortunes of this ambitious city were not unlike those of many another boomed and busted city of much more recent date no time was lost in beginning three ships arrived at roanoke on the twenty second of july fifteen eighty seven every effort was made to find the fifteen men left behind the year before by grenville to hold possession for the queen mounds of earth which may even now be traced so piously have their last remains been cared for mark the site of the fort from natives of croatoan island the newcomers learned that grenville's men had been murdered by hostile indians one native friend was found in mantio a chief whom barlow had taken to england and grenville had brought back mantio was now living with his own tribe of sea-coast indians on croatoan island but the mischief between red and white had been begun and though mantio had been baptized and was recognized as the lord of roanoke the races were becoming fatally estranged after a month governor white went home for more men and supplies leaving most of the colonists at roanoke he found elizabeth raleigh and the rest all working to meet the great armada yet even during the following year the momentous year of fifteen eighty eight raleigh managed to spare two pinnaces with fifteen colonists aboard well provided with all that was most needed a spanish squadron however forced both pinnaces to run back for their lives 
after this frustrated attempt two more years passed before white could again sail for virginia in august fifteen ninety his trumpeter sounded all the old familiar english calls as he approached the little fort no answer came the colony was lost for ever white had arranged that if the colonists should be obliged to move away they should carve the name of the new settlement on the fort or surrounding trees and if there was either danger or distress they should cut a cross above the one word croatoan was all white ever found there was no cross white's beloved colony white's favorite daughter and her little girl were perhaps in hiding but supplies were running short white was a mere passenger on board the ship that brought him and the crew were getting impatient so impatient for refreshment and a spanish prize that they sailed past croatoan refusing to stop a single hour perhaps white learnt more than is recorded and was satisfied that all the colonists were dead perhaps not nobody knows only a wandering tradition comes out of that impenetrable mystery and circles round the not impossible romance of young virginia dare her father was one of white's twelve assistants her mother eleanor was white's daughter virginia herself the first of all true native-born americans was born on the eighteenth of august fifteen eighty seven perhaps mantio lord of roanoke saved the whole family whose name has been commemorated by that of the north carolina county of dare perhaps virginia dare alone survived to be an indian queen about the time the first permanent anglo-american colony was founded in sixteen hundred and seven twenty years after her birth who knows these twenty sundering years from the end of this abortive colony in fifteen eighty seven to the beginning of the first permanent colony in sixteen hundred and seven constitute a period that saw the close of one age and the opening of another in every relation of anglo-american affairs nor was it only in anglo-american affairs that change was ripe the hon east india company entered upon its wonderful career shakespeare began to write his immortal plays the chosen translators began their work on the authorized version of the english bible the puritans were becoming a force within the body politic as well as in religion ulster was planted with englishmen and lowland scots in the midst of all these changes the great queen grown old and very lonely died in sixteen hundred and three and with her ended the glorious tudor dynasty of england james pusillanimous and pedantic son of darnley and mary queen of scots ascended the throne as the first of the sinister stuarts and truckling to vindictive spain threw raleigh into prison under suspended sentence of death there was a break of no less than fifteen years in english efforts to colonize america nothing was tried between the last attempt at roanoke in fifteen eighty seven and the first attempt in massachusetts in sixteen hundred and two when thirty-two people sailed from england with bartholomew gosnold formerly a skipper in raleigh's employ gosnold made straight for the coast of maine which he sighted in may he then coasted south to cape cod continuing south he entered buzzards bay where he landed on cuttyhunk island here on a little island in a lake an island within an island he built a fort round which the colony was expected to grow but supplies began to run out there was bad blood over the proper division of what remained the would-be colonists could not agree with those who had no intention of staying behind the result was that the entire project had to be given up gosnold sailed home with the whole disgusted crew and a cargo of sassafras and cedar such was the first prospecting ever done for what is now new england the following year sixteen hundred and three just after the death of queen elizabeth some merchant venturers of bristol sent out two vessels under martin pring like gosnold pring first made the coast of maine and then felt his way south 
unlike gosnold however he bore into the great gulf of massachusetts bay where he took in a cargo of sassafras at plymouth harbour but that was all the prospecting done this time there was no attempt at colonizing two years later another prospector was sent out by a more important company the earl of southampton and sir ferdinando gorgeous were the chief promoters of this enterprise gorgeous as lord proprietary of the province of maine is a well-known character in the subsequent history of new england lord southampton as shakespeare's only patron and greatest personal friend is forever famous through the world the chief prospector chosen by the company was george weymouth who landed on the coast of maine explored a little of the surrounding country kidnapped five indians and returned to england with a glowing account of what he had seen the cumulative effect of the three expeditions of gosnold pring and weymouth was a revival of interest in colonization prominent men soon got together and formed two companies which were formally chartered by king james on the tenth of april sixteen hundred and six the first or southern colony which came to be known as the london company because most of its members lived there was authorized to make its first plantation at any place upon the coast of virginia or america between the four and thirty and one and forty degrees of latitude the northern or second colony afterwards called the plymouth company was authorized to settle any place between thirty eight degrees and forty five degrees north thus overlapping both the first company to the south and the french to the north in the summer of the same year sixteen hundred and six henry challens took two ships of the plymouth company round by the west indies where he was caught in a fog by the spaniards later in the season pring went out and explored north virginia in may sixteen hundred and seven a hundred and twenty men under george popham started to colonize this north virginia in august they landed in maine at the mouth of the kennebec where they built a fort some houses and a pinnace finding themselves short of provisions two-thirds of their number returned to england late in the same year the remaining third passed a terrible winter popham died and raleigh gilbert succeeded him as governor when spring came all the survivors of the colony sailed home in the pinnace they had built and the enterprise was abandoned the reports of the colonists after their winter in maine were to the effect that the second or northern colony was not habitable for englishmen in the meantime the permanent foundation of the first or southern colony the real virginia was well under way the same number of intending emigrants went out a hundred and twenty on the twenty sixth of april sixteen hundred and seven about four o'clock in the morning we described the land of virginia the same day we entered into the bay of chesapeake chesapeake thus begins the tale of captain john smith of the founding of jamestown and of a permanent virginia the first of the future united states now that we have seen one spot in vast america really become the promise of the english nation which raleigh had longed for we must return once more to raleigh himself as mocked by his tantalizing vision he looked out on a changing world from his secular mount pisgah in the prison tower of london by this time he had felt both extremes of fortune to the full during the travesty of justice at his trial the attorney-general having no sound argument covered him with slanderous abuse these are three of the false accusations on which he was condemned to death viperous traitor damnable atheist and spider of hell hawkins drake frobisher and grenville all were dead so raleigh last of the great elizabethan lions was caged and baited for the sport of spain six of his twelve years of imprisonment were lightened by the companionship of his wife elizabeth throgmorton 
most beautiful of all the late queen's maids of honour another solace was the history of the world the writing of which set his mind free to wander forth at will although his body stayed behind the bars but the contrast was too poignant not to wring this cry of anguish from his preface yet when we once come in sight of the port of death to which all winds drive us and when by letting fall that fatal anchor which can never be weighed again the navigation of this life takes end then it is i say that our own cogitations those sad and severe cogitations formerly beaten from us by our health and felicity return again and pay us to the uttermost for all the pleasing passages of our life past at length in the spring of sixteen sixteen raleigh was released though still unpardoned he and his devoted wife immediately put all that remained of their fortune into a new venture twenty years before this he thought he could make discovery of the mighty rich and beautiful empire of guiana and of that great and golden city which the spaniards called el dorado and the natives call manoa now he would go back to find the el dorado of his dreams somewhere inland that mysterious manoa among those southern mountains of bright stones which lay behind the spanish main the king's cupidity was roused and so in sixteen seventeen raleigh was commissioned as the admiral of fourteen sail in november he arrived off the coast that guarded all the fabled wealth still lying undiscovered in the far recesses of the orinocan wilds guiana manoa el dorado the inland voices called him on but spaniards barred the way and raleigh defying the instructions of the king attacked them the english force was far too weak and disaster followed raleigh's son and heir was killed and his lieutenant committed suicide his men began to mutiny spanish troops and ships came closing in and the forlorn remnant of the expedition on which such hopes were built went straggling home to england there raleigh was arrested and sent to the block on the twenty ninth of october sixteen eighteen he had played the great game of life and death and lost it when he mounted the scaffold he asked to see the axe feeling the edge he smiled and said tis a sharp medicine but a cure for all diseases then he bared his neck and died like one who had served the great queen as her captain of the guard End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve drake's end drake in disfavor after fifteen hundred and eighty nine seems a contradiction that nothing can explain it can however be quite easily explained though never explained away he had simply failed to make the lisbon expedition pay a heinous offence in days when the navy was as much a revenue department as the customs or excise he had also failed to take lisbon itself the reasons why mattered nothing either to the disappointed government or to the general public but six years later in fifteen ninety five when drake was fifty and hawkins sixty three england called on them both to strike another blow at spain elizabeth was helping henry the fourth of france against the league of french and spanish catholics henry astute as he was gallant had found paris worth a mass and to elizabeth's dismay had gone straight over to the church of rome with terms of toleration for the huguenots the war against the holy league however had not yet ended the effect of henry's conversion was to make a more united france against the encroaching power of spain and every eye in england was soon turned on drake and hawkins for a stroke at spanish power beyond the sea 
drake and hawkins formed a most unhappy combination made worse by the fact that hawkins now old beyond his years soured by misfortune and staled for the sea by long spells of office work was put in as a check on drake in whom elizabeth had lost her former confidence sir thomas baskerville was to command the troops here at least no better choice could have possibly been made baskerville had fought with rare distinction in the breast campaign and before that in the netherlands there was the usual hesitation about letting the fleet go far from home the purely defensive school was still strong elizabeth in certain moods belonged to it and an incident which took place about this time seemed to give weight to the argument of the defensivists a small spanish force obliged to find water and provisions in a hurry put into mouse hole in cornwall and finding no opposition burnt several villages down to the ground the moment these spaniards heard that drake and hawkins were at plymouth they decamped but this ridiculous raid threw the country into doubt or consternation elizabeth was as brave as a lion for herself but she never grasped the meaning of naval strategy and she was supersensitive to any strong general opinion however false drake and hawkins with baskerville's troops all in transports and many supply vessels for the west india voyage were ordered to cruise about ireland and spain looking for enemies the admirals at once pointed out that this was the work of the channel fleet not that of a joint expedition bound for america then just as the queen was penning an angry reply she received a letter from drake saying that the chief spanish treasure ship from mexico had been seen in puerto rico little better than a wreck and that there was time to take her if they could only sail at once the expedition was on the usual joint stock lines and elizabeth was the principal shareholder she swallowed the bait whole and sent sailing orders down to plymouth by return and so on the twenty eighth of august fifteen ninety five twenty five hundred men in twenty seven vessels sailed out bound for new spain surprise was essential for new spain taught by repeated experience was well armed and twenty five hundred men were less formidable now than five hundred twenty years before arrived at the canaries las palmas was found too strong to carry by immediate assault and drake had no time to attack it in form he was two months late already so he determined to push on to the west indies when drake reached puerto rico he found the spanish in a measure forewarned and forearmed though he astonished the garrison by standing boldly in the harbor and dropping anchor close to a masked battery the real surprise was now against him the spanish gunners got the range to an inch brought down the flagship's mizzen knocked drake's chair from under him killed two senior officers beside him and wounded many more in the meantime hawkins worn out by his exertions had died this reception added to the previous failures and the astonishing strength of puerto rico produced a most depressing effect drake weighed anchor and went out he was soon back in a new place cleverly shielded from the spanish guns by a couple of islands after some more manoeuvres he attacked the spanish fleet with fireballs and by boarding when a burning frigate lit up the whole wild scene the spanish gunners and musketeers poured into the english ships such a concentrated fire that drake was compelled to retreat he next tried the daring plan of running straight into the harbour where there might still be a chance but the spaniards sank four of their own valuable vessels in the harbour mouth guns stores and all just in the nick of time and thus completely barred the way foiled again drake dashed for the mainland seized la hacha burnt it ravaged the surrounding country and got away with a successful haul of treasure then he seized santa marta and nombre de dios both of which were found nearly empty 
the whole of new spain was taking the alarm the dragon's back again meanwhile a fleet of more than twice drake's strength was coming out from spain to attack him in the rear nor was this all for baskerville and his soldiers who had landed at nombre de dios and started overland were in full retreat along the road from panama having found an impregnable spanish position on the way it was a sad beginning for fifteen ninety six the centennial year of england's first connection with america since our return from panama he never carried mirth nor joy in his face wrote one of baskerville's officers who was constantly near drake a council of war was called and drake making the best of it asked which they would have truxillo the port of honduras or the golden towns round about lake nicaragua both answered baskerville one after the other so the course was laid for san juan on the nicaragua coast a head wind forced drake to anchor under the island of veragua a hundred and twenty-five miles west of nombre de dios bay and right in the deadliest part of that fever-stricken coast the men began to sicken and die off drake complained at table that the place had changed for the worse his earlier memories of new spain were of a land like a pleasant and delicious arbor very different from the vast and desert wilderness he felt all round him now the wind held foul more and more men lay dead or dying at last drake himself the man of iron constitution and steel nerves fell ill and had to keep his cabin then reports were handed in to say the stores were running low and that there would soon be too few hands to man the ships on this he gave the order to weigh and take the wind as god had sent it so they stood out from that pestilential mosquito gulf and came to anchor in the fine harbour of puerto bello which the spaniards had chosen to replace the one at nombre de dios twenty miles east here in the night of the twenty seventh of january drake suddenly sprang out of his berth dressed himself and raved of battles fleets armadas plymouth hoe and plots against his own command the frenzy passed away he fell exhausted and was lifted back to bed again then like a christian he yielded up his spirit quietly his funeral rites befitted his renown the great new spanish fort of puerto bello was given to the flames as were nearly all the spanish prizes and even two of his own english ships for there were now no sailors left to man them thus amid the thunder of the guns whose voice he knew so well and surrounded by consuming pyres afloat and on the shore his body was committed to the deep while muffled drums rolled out their last salute and trumpets wailed his requiem end of chapter twelve end of elizabethan sea dogs by william wood